aggregate demand, aggregate supply. So you lost some points if you didn't get that done. So aggregate demand, aggregate supply. So the graph you were graphing or meant to there was supposed to be in kind of aggregate demand, aggregate supply space. Where what are we measuring down here? Uh, employment is what we did on the graph, but in aggregate demand, aggregate supply space, what are we measuring here? GDP. All right. So this was GDP, and up here, inflation, which is what we did have there. Uh, I didn't mind if you did uh, either the month-to-month -month change with inflation or 12-month uh, moving average with inflation. So either either way was fine. Uh, in some ways, the 12-month the moving average was kind of nice because it showed the annualized inflation rate, which is what we usually see in our textbook, right? When we say inflation here, we're usually talking about the annual inflation rate, so if aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply are here, and that's at an inflation rate of 1.8%, it was 1.8%, and furthermore in the book, it's usually the calendar year, right? So if we talk about the 2012, 2012 inflation, is typically inflation, the price level on, and we usually don't get into this level of detail, but 1-1-2011, or 12, to 2000, or 1-31-2012, right? So when you see the 2012 inflation rate, it's typically the calendar year. Right? But it's one year. So in that exercise you had, we have the price level is calculated by the Bureau of Statistics, the BLS, how frequently? How frequently is the data collected? It's what you had, what, what you reported. Monthly. So the index number, the price level, is January, let me try to keep some consistent notation here. Price level for January, price level for February, price level for uh, what comes next, March, right? So that number, if that was, uh, if the price level was uh, 167, and then the price level for February was 167.2, and the price level for uh, March was 167.8, right? It's the index number being measured each month after month after month. And so the annual inflation rate simply plucks off dot, 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 the price level down to uh, number equals 169.4. The annual price level is just 169.4 Minus 167 divided by 167 gives you the 2012 price level, right? And so that's what we normally see in the textbook. So that's kind of nice to kind of compare to. Um, what some of you did is took the 12-month moving average for the inflation rate. So what is the annualized inflation rate versus the monthly inflation rate? What I had done on what I showed you here was this number minus this number divided by this number. It was the month by month change is what this was. If you instead took the price level in March minus the price level in March of the previous year, right? So it's whatever this number was 12 months ago up here, this number minus that number divided by that number gives you the annualized inflation rate as you move through time. And then the next month, or this month, rather, if we take uh, February, we're taking this number minus 12 months ago, divided by 12 months ago, right, gives you that. So that's called a moving average, which you guys have seen in your statistics classes. It's a 12-month moving average. 
And so that was another way that some of you did it, which was fine. I didn't take off any points. Uh, it wasn't quite what we had here, but it's okay if you, if you had done it that way. All right, questions on that distinction? These are kind of important concepts working with the macro aggregate data, uh, the important ones of GDP and inflation, all of that stuff um, is what we're, what we're thinking about. Okay, so we got to the point of building our model, which is where I was I started to draw this thing so I could complete it. That's kind of a weird, this is supposed to be a perfectly vertical line. <coughs> All right, so this is our home base for um, our aggregate demand, aggregate supply model. And so the inflation rate in equilibrium is pi 1, and the economy is operating at our potential rate, yp. What is the unemployment rate at the potential level of real GDP? What is the unemployment rate at the potential level of real GDP? The natural rate of unemployment, right? So there was a connection here with the natural rate. And so this is going to bring us into our, our discussion today of, of um, a little more detail on the short run aggregate supply curve for starters. And then uh, we'll look, we'll think about different movements. Um, so what that exercise with Excel was meant to do was to get you thinking about how the economy moves. Why I wanted you to connect the dots is that these things might be moving in the short run in different directions. And that's the movement of the economy of these macroeconomic aggregates. Okay. Questions? Tee you up after the break, after the tryptophan has molded or melted your brain for a temporary period of time. Okay, so short run aggregate supply has a little more detail than what we've what we've covered. And I am going to Kind of bring in part of the appendix. The appendix is also part of the material for this chapter. So the appendix talks about uh, the Phillips curve, and that is part of your um, required readings for chapter 23. So don't just skip the appendix. That, that's going to be part of it. And I'm going to tie that in uh, today with uh, expectations. All right, so. Um, when I started you off with the uh, short run aggregate supply curve, I mentioned resource prices being important to me. And so there's a little bit more detail to that, depending on uh, what type of resource prices and what, what makes that up. So there's a equation that uh, so three factors that shift the short run aggregate supply curve. Number one is expected inflation, which we'll use the notation pi e, expected inflation. So not what it is today, but rather what do we think it's going to be in the future. Number two, um, price shocks. And that was resource prices, kind of oil prices jumping up. So that was similar to what, uh, what we did. So you can put even as an example, uh, oil price uh, shock in the 70s, in the 1970s is kind of our famous example where uh, the Middle East was able to uh, ramp up prices. It was due to other international conflicts and other things going on. So there's multiple things, but 
Bottom line is oil prices shot up, and that caused oil is a pretty important factor of production in the United States, which caused um, some inflation. So that would be modeled by this short run aggregate supply curve shifting to the left. And then finally, number three is persistent output gap. A persistent output gap. <clears throat> so the output gap in general, we mentioned it at one point, is the distance we are from our potential. So from an equation standpoint, it's actual output minus our potential output. Actual output minus our potential output. So if this is negative, then our actual output is less than potential, right? So if we put some numbers on here just to keep things easy, this is 10, 10 trillion and this is 8 trillion. So if we're actually at 8 trillion, 8 minus 10 is a negative 2. So we have a negative output gap, right? And whereas if we're at 12, if our actual output's 12, 12 minus 10 equals 2, the output gap is positive. All right, and so depending on where that gap is, if it's a persistent output gap, um, that could lead to uh, the short run aggregate supply curve uh, shifting. And we'll talk about reasons why here in a second. But putting all these things together, your textbook gives us um, way of explaining the actual inflation rate is a function of our inflation expectations plus gamma times the output gap plus rho, which is the price shock. Now they do it kind of cutesy this way. I mean, we use some Greek letters. This isn't uncommon for economists to get a little cutesy with their math. We've got, all this is saying is that if this is like 12 trillion minus 10 trillion, you've got 2 trillion. Well, this gamma factor is going to be some parameter that converts it into percentages, right? That explains the inflation gap. So we're just saying there's some factor there that plays a role in how important the output gap is to determining inflation. And then same thing with rho. Rho is, is capturing the price shock. Um, that price shock could be in some form. They're just kind of leaving it as a constant rho uh, that will bump up the uh, prices. Okay, so hopefully this doesn't confuse you. All it's trying to say is these are the three factors that we kind of listed in words here. These are the three factors that make up the actual inflation rate um, for, for the economy. Okay, questions on that? Hopefully it'll become a little more clear as we can take you down this path a little bit further. All right, so what I wanted to do was tie this into the appendix. So I'm kind of going a little bit out of order of the textbook reading. The appendix, by the way, is just a few pages long, maybe three to four, so it's not too much additional. Um, but I think this will tie together this inflation expectation a little bit nicer by bringing together the aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and the Phillips curve. Okay, so what is the Phillips curve? Let me, uh, let's see, you guys probably would be mad at me if I didn't do that. Everybody seen me over here? Yeah, I can. It's totally fine. All right, so let's do the Phillips group. Now, you guys did get kind of exposed to this with last, the presentation we did before break with the trade off between inflation and unemployment. We were actually doing kind of a Phillips curve um, uh, connection there. So the Phillips curve um, is uh, a model that 
explains possible trade offs, possible trade offs of uh, inflation and unemployment. And there's some pictures in your book that I'll spare you some of the details. But Phillips was next to the 50s that did a long term study on inflation and unemployment. He actually looked at wage inflation, but it was connected to inflation and then later supported. And after collecting data, he saw a data cloud of data points that looked like this over time. So this might have been 1854. 1856, 1875, 1894, right? So year after year, this is like 50 years worth of data, uh, similar to how you guys were collecting data on unemployment inflation. He did the same thing, although it was a lot harder to, uh, to get and calculate it at that time. And so he uh, astutely looked at this and said, wow, there seems to be a negative relationship between inflation and unemployment. Well, this resonated well with big government, uh, to kind of put it short. In the 1950s, we're just coming off the heels of John Maynard's 1936, uh, the general theory, and big government's kind of on the rise. Hey, we can pull some strings and make the economy work. We're really smart now. We've got this figured out. As long as we get enough, enough group of smart people in the room, we can kind of orchestrate the economy. We can make things look good. And so part of this showed that if we, if we have to choose between these two things, which one do we want, right? So if we go back to our three goals of the economy, higher unemployment, but lower inflation, which one's meeting those goals? Low, as we move this way along the Phillips curve from let's say point A to B, we're getting more unemployment but less inflation. Good or bad for the economy? How about the inflation part? Good. Unemployment part? Bad. Right? That's the trade-off we're talking about. So it's going to be this kind of policy trade-off potential of these two things. And so again, if we move from B to A instead, we get higher inflation, but less unemployment. That's good. So which one do you think politicians favored? Which one would politicians favor more? Would they go with the low unemployment or the low inflation? Low unemployment. Why? Makes what? Makes them look better. Makes them look better, right? Puts people to work. People vote, right? So if you've got voters, people who are working might give more votes. And so we tended to see this this push of, oh, okay, well, let's make unemployment, let's move this way. If we're going to move anywhere between A or B, if we have a choice, A sure looks nicer than B. <laughs> well, then, as the story goes, um, Milton Friedman in the 1960s said, uh, I don't think there's any trade off at all. I don't think this is sustainable. That doesn't make sense in theory that there's any trade off between these two. So he makes this prediction. People thought that he was just some sort of ivory tower academic that was lost in the clouds, you know, making predictions about stuff. And then lo and behold, the 1972, 1973, 74, 75, 76, we get some new data points for the United States. And they're up here. And people are scratching their head. Wait a second, we had 50 years worth of data that is supposed to be down here. Why is that? Well, there was more to the story with the inflations. And what started to come about from some other economists was the role of expectations in the economy, how expectations play a role. So that's where our, our model starts to take a turn it is with the uh, addition of changing expectations because of big government, which we didn't really have to worry about prior to the Great Depression, we might have had 100 years worth of history that didn't include the government too much because the Constitution laid out this idea that let's keep government limited and let the free market kind of work its way out. That was the Adam Smith concept. 
Great Depression happens, they're like, oh crap, I guess this free market stuff maybe has problems. Turns out maybe the government caused some of the problems, but that's part of the tensions that we've been talking about. And so we start a new path with bigger government and we end up here. Well, let's take a look why that might have been. So on the next thing, I want you to graph two things side by side with each other. This one will not be in your textbook, but I do expect you to know it, otherwise I won't be giving it to you. So this could be potential final exam material. On the graph to the left, we have the goods market, which is our aggregate demand, aggregate supply. I sometimes call it the goods market. So same thing, you guys can put in our home base for starters here. Long run aggregate supply, aggregate demand, short run aggregate supply, which gives us some initial amount of inflation in the economy, call it pi one, and some initial output that is the economy operating at its potential. Sheldon, what's so funny? You got people in there, or what are you doing? Why don't you take it off? Take your microphone off. What? So I just wonder what's so funny. Something oh. on your screen that's not me, or I didn't know I made such a good joke. No, I wasn't laughing. I was coughing. Coughing. Oh, okay. Coughing with a smile. All right. All right. So make sure you got all your distractions off in your room with people and other screens and stuff like that. Okay. So. On the graph to the right, we're going to be mapping the Phillips curve, where we're going to measure unemployment on the horizontal axis and inflation on the vertical. Okay, so if everything's humming along here at the potential, this amount of GDP corresponds directly with some amount of unemployment only frictional and structural unemployment, the natural rate. So here we got this connection here that is important fundamentally. And similar to the longer and aggregate supply curve being independent of prices, what were the things that shifted the longer and aggregate supply curve? Things that moved the economy, that caused long-term economic growth, Resources and technology, right? So that's what causes this sucker to move to the right, and that would be real long-term economic growth that we can kind of count on, the resource-based expanding and technology growing. And that's going to be associated with some level of unemployment. And so let's just leave it like that for now, whatever that natural rate is. So the Phillips curve, I suppose I could be working with this. Let me, uh, okay, bear with me a sec here, because I'm going to, normally in macro class, I, we have the price level here. Now that we got this here, I guess let me try to be more careful. And this is the short run Phillips curve. All right, so in equilibrium, our actual inflation rate is also equal to what we expect it to be. So in equilibrium, our expected inflation rate is what our actual inflation rate turned out to be, according to this, the way we've got this drawn. Okay, so we got the short run Phillips curve. <coughs> In the long run, what uh, Friedman was hypothesizing was that this thing must have shifted. In order to explain this, we had a shift of the short run Phillips curve. This is where we started, but then we shifted up. 
And, be, and this kind of plays into the, to the natural rate of unemployment, that somewhere in here is the natural rate of unemployment. And so in the long run, we don't have a trade off The long run Phillips curve, the long run Phillips curve is right here, no relationship. Okay. So, expectation. If the uh, expectations are rational, rational expectations, So rational expectations have some properties that we expect them to have. One is that they are correct on average. And number two is that they have small forecast error. You guys remember the bell curve from statistics class or classes? So what was the height of the bell? What did that, what did this picture mean here roughly? Who remembers statistics? 50%? Uh, not necessarily, but it was something on percentage. What's that? What was where? Here or here? In the middle. All right, so your prediction or your average was here. If you were trying to make a prediction about the future, you don't know what it's going to be, but your best guess takes in all the information and says, I think that we're going to be at uh, 10.2 trillion real GDP or whatever, right? In other words, that number has the highest probability of being correct. And so the top of the bell represents the percentage that that number is right. I have a 40% chance that that is right, but I might be wrong, but I've got the highest probability of that number being right. Whereas 10.3 has a lower chance of being right, right? That, that's kind of the idea of the bell curve. So your most probable answer is here. And if we do the, the full forecasting measure, we think that we're going to be within a, a, a range, like we're 95% confident that our prediction is going to be somewhere in this range. That's just the concept of, of what we're doing with, with forming an expectation. And so the key is that we're using all available information. So RE, a rational expectation, is a forecast based on all available information. That's what makes it rational. If it's just a wild ass guess, that's a different thing. That's not a rational expectation. Because I can go around to anybody, even a fifth grader, and say, what do you think GDP is going to be next year? And they can give you a wild ass guess, right? But that's not going to be a rational expectation. A rational expectation is one in which we use all available information to make our forecast in a, in a meaningful, thoughtful, uh, scholarly way, perhaps. Okay, so questions on that? That plays in over here now. So when we learned that Janet Yellen is considering, we've listened to her talks the last two months, and we think that there's going to be an interest rate rise, right, interest rate change, then we might start to form an expectation about what's going to happen to aggregate demand. Now, if in addition to that, Trump has come up with some spending plan for roads and bridges and reduced regulation, when Janet's jacking up the interest rate and Trump's doing some stuff and reducing regulation with his 100-day plan in the first 100 days, 
we start to process that. We say, ah, so Janet moving up, that's bad, but Trump reducing regulation, that should be good. And, and so we process all that information. And at the end of the day, we're going to end up forming an expectation about where we think the economy is going to be. Let's call that EAD, the expected aggregate demand curve. The expected aggregate demand curve. Now, one thing that bodes well for classical economist theory that prices clear quickly, so they don't really think, agree with Keynes saying in the long run we're all dead, that there's a lot of wage and price rigidity, that prices are sticky, but rather they adjust. They're, they all agree that maybe there's some lag time between output prices and resource prices, but in some amount of time, prices are going to adjust fairly quickly. Well, what's unique about this rational expectation is that now we've given the opportunity for people to change their behavior based on their expectation, not just a reaction to what has actually happened. In other words, if you remember when we did this the first time, I just did the shift of aggregate demand to the right, right? Remember that? And then we went from one to two to three. And then I gave you the whole story of, well, how fast is one to two to three? Kane said in the long run, we're all dead. Friedman and others and Hayek said, well, prices adjust fairly quickly. One to two to three will go fairly fast. Well, with expectations theory, it allows a mechanism for quicker adjustments, or at least a justification for quicker adjustments. Because if we think that after thinking through Janet and Trump and the rest of it, that aggregate demand is going to go here. Is inflation going to be higher or lower than what it is today? Higher, right? In other words, we're expecting it to go here, so inflation would go here. Now, that would be a movement along the short-run aggregate supply curve, which holds resource prices constant. But if you feel pretty comfortable with your expectation, then you might start asking for those pay raises sooner rather than later. And so the idea is that we're going to have a new short-run aggregate supply curve based on that expectation. In other words, the economy in the long run is going to head to this point three that I'm not writing the one, two, three today out. So we're going to see resource prices adjust right away. So our expected our expected inflation rate at the end of the day is here. No longer here. If we expect inflation to grow, one of the things that this was built on was an expected inflation rate staying the same. A higher inflation rate shifts the short run Phillips curve up by the amount of the expectation. So this is now anchoring here. Another way we can note this is to say this is at pi E1, this is at pi E2, the new inflation rate, the new expected inflation rate. Okay. So if we are correct, now we let the game play out and the actual aggregate demand curve shifts the red one, the economy simply moves from point one to point two. Never does this one to two to three business, right? So the long run and the short run have collapsed down quite a bit because of behavior based on expectations. See how that's shortened the time frame between long run and short run? So moving from here to here, 
the economy stays at its potential. End of story. So how do we get fluctuations in real GDP? Because we know that the economy actually does do this. It doesn't shift how we predict it. In fact, it's really hard to know exactly where it's going to go. Is the, I mean, I gave you three simple dumb things with Trump 100 day plan. I didn't mention all the other 100 things that he had. In addition to what is Japan doing? How is Brexit going to play out? What's our relationship with China going to be? Right? How is the U.S. workers' uh, feelings different? Does that make them encouraged about the economy so that they go out and buy more? In other words, there's a zillion things that are packaged up into that. The likelihood of being correct is probably close to zero, more realistically. Now, we might not be too far off. That's this part, small forecast here. In other words, we think it's going to be here. It might be here, it might be here, but it's not going to be here, right, where we double GDP. Or it's not going to be here where GDP was cut in half, right? So we have a small forecast error, and if we are wrong, if we underestimated the actual change in GDP, is the actual aggregate demand here or here? if we underestimated actual GDP, or actual aggregate demand, is it here or here? If we underestimated it. Second one. How many people say second one? Got a little bit of support, one, two, three? How many people say first one? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, majority sounds like it's going this way, right? So actual GDP here, you estimated here, the shift was bigger, so we call that an under, you underestimated the change, the magnitude, right? The magnitude was bigger than what you expected, so you underestimated the change. If it ended up here, you overshot, you overestimated the actual real GDP. All right, so what that does for us is if, if the economy actually goes here, so if AD2 actually moves out to here, the short run equilibrium for the economy is always shown by the intersection of the actual aggregate demand curve and the actual short run aggregate supply curve, which is right here. And there's our fluctuation. GDP goes up to Y2 creating a positive output gap. Real GDP is greater than potential. Unemployment does what? Unemployment goes down, up. If GDP is greater than its potential, more people working, less working. More people working, higher unemployment, or less unemployment? Less unemployment. So we'd be moving this direction here, right? So with the unemployment going down, now what happened with the actual rate of inflation? The actual inflation rate, pi 2, is greater than what we expected. So what we end up getting here is a movement along the Phillips curve with U2 being the current unemployment rate and pi 2 being the actual inflation rate, different than what was expected. And so Phillips wasn't completely wrong, because really the data can't be wrong. We had some sort of trade-off going on, but he missed out on the ingredient of how expectations played a role and how historians, economic historians would look at that is to say, well, we had no reason to believe that inflation was going to be really high or changing, right? So our inflation expectation was pretty stable. We never changed it. But then when big government came in and started printing off money, causing the inflation that the data shows in the 19... 
70s with the high inflation, that changed people's expectations. They started planning on more inflation, higher prices, higher prices, right? And so they adjusted their expectations. And so we still have that trade off. But now we get the trade off for a different reason. It's because we had uh, unanticipated changes to aggregate demand. We anticipated this, we got this. It's a completely different <laughs> narrative that rational expectations brings to the table for the discussion. <laughs> All right, so let me sum up a couple things here. <laughs> so you guys got a clear path, hopefully, on your notes. Um, let's call these uh, points one, two, and three. And that kind of corresponds to points one, two, and three on the Phillips curve drawn. Okay, so summary. Number one, long run equilibrium. That's where we started off. Number two, the public forms a rational expectation about where aggregate demand will be in the future, which is our EAD. Number three. public forms inflation expectation and resource prices adjust. Which is the increase in the short run aggregate supply curve. That was our, I guess I didn't put a two on here, so this is number two. In the Phillips curve space, we had a shift up of the Phillips curve. So an increase in the short run Phillips curve to SRPC IE2. Number five, the actual aggregate demand does not equal what we expect. And the way I have it drawn, it was greater than what we expected. So we had a, we underestimated, we underestimated the aggregate demand. Number six, the economy moves to new short run equilibrium. With AD2 and short run aggregate supply two. 
level of real GDP is greater than potential, a positive output gap. And the actual inflation rate, I2, is greater than what we expected. This is a movement along the Phillips curve. Probably could have made these different steps, but number seven, we've got unemployment below the natural rate. U2 is less than the natural rate. I already said this, but Y2 is greater than the potential rate, the potential level of real GDP. All right, so the last step here is bringing us to the self correcting mechanism is what your textbook calls it, what I refer to as the invisible hand of Adam Smith. If we just left things alone, if we just left things alone, our Output prices too high or are resource prices too high? If we just left things alone, how would the economy self-correct here? How would the economy self-correct? If we're at point three, kind of what's wrong, if you will, with pricing structure? And it has to do with output prices and resource prices. Output prices are too high relative to resource prices, right? And so the self-correcting mechanism would be that resource prices would go up and we'd eventually move to point four is where we need to be. That's how things would kind of shake out if we just left things alone. But we probably never get there because what really goes on is that we're in this, well, where's... What's going to happen now? What's the Trump administration going to do? What's Janet going to do? What is China going to do? What is Brexit going to do? And we're always in this process of re-estimating where we're going to be. So this is really more of a process rather than a static picture of where things would go. All right. So we'll pick up there next time. That'll bring us into the a little bit more of the high discussion with Mr. Keynes. So. We'll see you on uh, Wednesday.